Two years ago, I converted a human-operated bench mill into a computer-operated CNC mill to make tricky parts like this. There are things I wish I knew before I started, and if you're interested in doing something similar, you might find this video helpful. I'll go through everything you need to know for choosing the mill, ball screw kit, motor kit, CNC control, and some extras that'll make using the machine more efficient. I'm not affiliated with any manufacturers mentioned in this video. These bench mills all come with lead screws. These are the screws that came on the PM30, and for a manual milling, they're just fine. But for a CNC, it's a good idea to replace them with ball screws that'll give you more accurate motion. So before you go ahead and get a mill, it's a good idea to make sure you can source a ball screw kit for whatever mill you're looking at. A few popular mills for CNC conversions are the Precision Matthews PM25MV, PM30MV, and the Grizzly G0704. I'll be talking mostly about the PM30MV since it's what's sitting in my garage, but ball screw kits are available for all of them. In the US, you can get ball screw kits from Arizona Video 99 on YouTube. This is where I sourced my kit and can vouch for the quality. Another option is ProCut CNC. Not only do they sell ball screw kits, they also sell fully converted PM25s, PM30s, and G0704s with full enclosures and ready-to-go CNC controls. If building enclosures, wiring up motor drivers, and CNC controllers doesn't interest you, this might be the best option. So you've got to choose a mill. Other than making sure you can source a ball screw kit, the machine's price and power requirements will probably narrow you down to just a few options. Then there's kind of two other things you might want to consider. The first is rigidity. The more rigid the machine, the more material you'll remove in a single pass. If you're wondering how rigid the machine is, just look at the weight. A 1,000 pound mill is going to be more rigid than a 500 pound mill. The second is spindle power and max RPM. Generally speaking, the faster your spindle, the faster you'll machine. All things being equal, a 3,000 RPM spindle is going to machine about 35% faster than a 2,200 RPM spindle if it's got enough power. There's other factors, but this is a good rule of thumb. So which is more important, rigidity or spindle power and RPM? If you're going to be machining primarily plastics and aluminum, or making really small parts with small tools like 1 8 inch end mills or smaller, you should probably prioritize RPM. If you're looking for any significant material removal rates in stronger materials like steel, you should probably prioritize power and rigidity. It's also worth mentioning that you can always upgrade your spindle down the road, and it's not so easy to upgrade your mill's rigidity. So I decided to go for the PM30MV. Now, if you're on this screen, you're hit with a $3,700 price point. That's for the PM30MV with the three-axis DRO. That's this digital readout screen here, and if you're converting to CNC, you definitely don't need it. So if you go to the drop-down and select PM30MV, that's the same machine without the digital readout, and it's 3000 bucks, saving you 700 Then with the mill, there's some adders that you can spring for. I'm going to quickly give my opinion on what I think you should and shouldn't get, or if I were to do it all over again, what I would and wouldn't get. I did get the stand and regret it every day. They're really flimsy. It's more like a filing cabinet. And if you're doing manual milling, this is probably fine. But with CNC, when you get your rapids up and your feeds and speeds up, you get a lot of weight moving around much more quickly than you'd be able to do with manual milling. And so this thing does shake around quite a bit. Option one is to build a heavy duty welded base. If you don't have access to that kind of equipment, even a well-built wooden stand would serve you much better than this base. This x-axis power feed, because you're getting CNC, you don't need it. All these call it sets, I would not go for them because there are better options for faster tool changes that we'll go over shortly. Uh, and the same is true for all these keyless drill chucks. I wouldn't go for them. There's better options. Same for the boring head. This clamping kit, I would do it. The price is right, and you do need it from time to time. And the vices, they're not good, but they're cheap, and I would get them. I decided to go for this 5-inch ultra-high precision milling vise. I guess I would do it again only because I can't afford real vices that are closer to, say, 1000 or 1500 bucks, and you do kind of want two. Now, to start, maybe just get one, but if you're holding longer pieces or machining longer pieces that you want to hold in a vise, which I do pretty often, you often want to hold them across two vices. So um, you can use your judgment there. This whey oil, yep, that's good. I'd get that. That's just for lubricating the ways on the machine. And these end mill sets, I didn't get them, but they're quite cheap. If you're learning, that's probably not a bad idea. So you've got the mill and ball screw kit to go with it. There's two more things you'll have to choose, the motor kit and the CNC controller. As far as motors go, there's three options and you should only really consider two. The options are open loop stepper motors, closed loop stepper motors, and servo motors. I won't go into why here, but you should strike open loop steppers off the list. So what should you get, closed loop stepper motors or servo motors? The short answer is, if you don't mind spending the money, definitely go with servo motors. They're quieter, more accurate, overall better, and also over double the price of the closed loop stepper alternatives. Generally speaking, and without getting into micro stepping, a closed loop stepper motor will move the mill in one thousandth of an inch increments. And with servo motors, you can move in steps ten times smaller than that. I went with closed loop steppers. 
I'm using one of these NEMA 34 12 newton meter motors on every axis, and I don't really think it's necessary. I've heard that you can get away with only running a NEMA 34 12 newton meter on the Z, and then you can run NEMA 34 eight and a half newton meters on the X and the Y. What's neat about these kits is you can get away with only using one transformer that powers all three motor drives instead of having one power supply for every single drive. So I'm using one toroidal transformer that steps 220 volts down to 60 and goes right into the drivers. I'd say the downside of this is that these toroidal transformers have really bad inrush current problems and if you're fusing your systems you're likely going to have issues with blowing them when you fire the cabinet up. There are other options for dealing with inrush current limiting. I use this AC relay with a series resistor. It's a little bit hacky and if you want to get around having to do something like this you can easily just use three DC power supplies instead of one toroidal transformer. You won't have problems with inrush current if you use DC power supplies. Now the last thing you've got to decide on is the CNC controller. The controller looks at the G-code and sends step and direction signals to the motor drives which then bump the motors accordingly. I chose the Centroid Acorn controller. It's intuitive, easy to get up and running quickly, handles G-code well, I've never had any problems. If I were to do it again though, I might go with Linux CNC. The learning curve's steeper, it'll take you longer to get up and running, but it's endlessly customizable. Look at all these CNC control interfaces. They're all Linux CNC. There are many existing flavors of the software to choose from when you install Linux CNC, or you can even make your own. Here someone's made their own control interface and is pitching it as an alternative to existing configurations. There are even industrial controller manufacturers that use Linux CNC as the platform for their systems. The Centroid Acorn is able to control four axes. I'm using three of those axes for X, Y, and Z, and I could also set up a fourth axis or a tool changer or something, but then I'm full. The Acorn wouldn't be able to do both the fourth axis and an ATC. Linux CNC, on the other hand, can control as many motors as you want. Look at this, someone's controlling nine motors with Linux CNC, and the best part is it's free. You'll still have to get some hardware like these Mesa cards to communicate with your motor drives, but you'll never be hit with any software upgrade fees like you do with Acorn. The Acorn comes with a free version of the control software when you buy the controller, but if you want to run longer G-code files, run a fourth axis, do some probing, rigid tapping, make multiple parts in different work coordinate systems, you'll need to upgrade to the Pro for an extra 160 bucks. This is pretty much a must. If you want to get into digitizing, which is really cool but you probably won't need it, you'll have to upgrade to the digitizing bundle for another 300 bucks. You'll never see anything like this with Linux CNC. If you're looking to get up and running quickly, get the Acorn. I don't think you'll regret it. If you're into programming, don't mind tinkering a bit and want to leave yourself unlimited room for building out a more complex system in the future, Linux CNC is probably for you. There are other options like Mazo, Mach 3, UCNC, and I don't know much about them. Alright, so you've got the mill, ball screw kit, motor kit, and CNC controller. I'll quickly go through some extras I recommend that'll make using the mill quicker and more enjoyable. Machining's a lot of fun, but fumbling with tooling and setups isn't really. So, of all the extras, and by a long shot, the biggest favor you'll do yourself is going with the Tormach TTS tool holding system, instead of using collets to hold your end mills. All the mills mentioned in this video come with an R8 spindle, meaning it accepts collets that look like this. The problem with running collets directly in the spindle is that the clamping pressure on the end mill is released every time you change tools. So you have to update the tool stick out or offset in the control every time you load up a tool. This gets really old in a hurry. So why not use R8 tool holders? With a tool holder like this, an ER collet grips the end mill inside the tool holder, and when you take the tool holder out of the spindle, the end mill stays securely clamped and you won't have to update the tool offset next time you load the tool in the spindle. It's a much better solution than using straight collets. There's still two problems though. The first has to do with the R8 spindle geometry. If you over tighten the drawbar when loading up an R8 collet or R8 tool holder, you can actually wedge the taper into the spindle further than it was wedged in last time the tool was loaded. So if you're not using a torque wrench to tighten the drawbar to make sure you're wedging the tool holders into the spindle with the exact same amount of force every time, the tool offset can be different by up to about five thousandth of an inch or so. It might not sound like a lot, but a five thousand step is enough to notice on a part. The other drawback of using R8 tool holders is that you have to fully unthread the drawbar from the tool holder to take it out of the spindle. It might not sound like a big deal, but if you're making parts that need more than a couple tool changes, this does get really annoying. So hands down and by a long shot from everything I've seen, the Tormach TTS tool holding system is the best solution. This is the TTS adapter call it. It lives in the spindle and never comes out. Once this adapter is in your spindle, you gain the ability to use every single Tormach TTS tool holder in your mill. This is the kind of TTS side of a tool holder, and so every tool you see on the Tormach site that has an end that looks like this, you can now use on your mill. Look at this, you can use brooch holders, diamond engravers, indexable shear hogs, tension compression rigid tapping hats, and fly cutters, just to name a few. If you don't find everything you need here, there are third parties that make more TTS attachments, like this S5000 probe from Drewtronics. So not only does TTS give you access to all this tooling, the actual tool change is faster and more repeatable than using standard R8 tool holders. A crack looser on the drawbar releases the tool, and a crack tighter holds the next one. 
That's it. The tool change is done. There's no more having to unthread the drawbar all the way. And unlike standard R8 tool holders, the TTS system has this shoulder instead of this taper. So if you over tighten the drawbar, you'll still have the same stick out. There's no wedging this flat face further into the spindle if you over tighten it. You'll also need some way to evacuate chips while you're machining. If you're just machining around the outside of a part, the chips fall away and you don't really need any chip clearing. But if you're machining pockets, they'll accumulate inside the pocket and you'll start recutting chips. This is probably the easiest way to blow up your end mills. Here's a nice expensive end mill I junked by recutting chips. The only reason it's not in pieces is because I caught it soon enough. The two main options for chip clearing are air and flood coolant. I'm using a 60 gallon air compressor and it's definitely overkill but nice to have. It stays on maybe 10-20% of the time and lives in the basement. An air line running through the floors brings air into the garage and I can barely hear the compressor when it turns on, which is great. On the mill side, I use a lock line hose and this simple manifold block and ball valve to turn air on and off. Instead, you could use a solenoid valve fired by the CNC controller, which I plan on doing in the future. So as far as the essentials go, that's about it. If you've got everything up to this point in the video, you can start CNC machining. The rest of the video is going to be about some extras I use that you might want to consider down the road. This is a one-shot oiling system. It's a cheap little pump reservoir that you can get on eBay or from most industrial suppliers. When you pull on this lever, it squirts that ISO 68 way oil through a little manifold block that distributes oil to the X, Y, and Z axes. I haven't done it, but you can also pipe lines into the ball nuts to lubricate the ball screws. Franco on YouTube has a great video on how to set all this up. This little black and red trigger is a limit switch. There's one on every axis, and every time you turn on the machine, you can start a homing sequence that bumps the X, Y, and Z axes into these switches. The switches are wired into the CNC control, and they're used to prevent over-traveling in the machine. Without these switches, you can jog all the axes until they crash into the ends of their travel. With the switches installed, though, the CNC controller won't let you crash an axis into an end stop. If you've got a G-code file loaded up that exceeds the travel of the machine, you'll get a warning in the control before you start machining, which is nice. Limit switches are nice to have, but if you're careful, you don't really need them. This wireless pendant was another nice addition. This is my setup. I don't use a dedicated computer with a touchscreen monitor that lives beside the mill. I run the control software on a laptop about 10 feet from the machine. So the wireless pendant lets me get up close to the machine while still having control of it. It's $300 from Centroid and has a wireless receiver that plugs into the computer with USB. When you plug it in, it just kind of starts working with minimal setup because it's part of the Centroid ecosystem. Not insurmountable by any means, but a pendant would take more work to set up with, say, Linux CNC than it does with Centroid. This is the Drewtronics S5000 TTS probe. It's accurate to within a thousandth of an inch and helps set work coordinate offsets quickly through probing routines that come with the Centroid Mill Pro software upgrade. It also kind of turns your mill into a CMM, which is a coordinate measuring machine sometimes used in quality control when inspecting parts. Okay, it isn't as accurate as an actual CMM, but with this probe on this mill, you'll be good to within about a thousandth or two. I often copy existing parts on the mill, but before I can do that, you've got to model the part in CAD. And before you can do that, you need the parts measurements. The probe makes it easy to not only measure features on the part, like bore and hole sizes, but it also spits out the location of those features with respect to the work coordinate offset. You don't need a probe for this, you can use an edge finder, especially if you're just setting work coordinate offsets, but for copying parts, an edge finder would require you to do a lot more math. Still possible though. A couple more things you should have are a dial indicator, set of parallels, a half decent caliper, and as we just discussed, an edge finder. The dial indicator will help you square up vices on your table as well as calibrate the straightness of your machine. Parallels are used to put down in a vise before clamping stock material if you want to raise it up in the jaws. If you're using a vise, you'll pretty much do this every time. The calipers will help you pretty accurately measure parts. They're not super if you're trying to measure with accuracy of less than a thousandth or so, but they're kind of the jack of all trades and will give you a lot of information. And the edge finder will help you set work coordinate offsets before you start machining. The last thing I'll mention is 3D printing. If you've got a 3D printer, you'll be able to make all kinds of useful stuff. These hose clamps, cable clamps, e-stop button bracket, cable grommet, fuse holder, file holder, screw trays, and pretty much everything in this drawer were 3D printed. Sure, you can buy all this stuff, but where's the fun in that? This way you can make things exactly the way you want them and look like a huge nerd doing it. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video.